Welcome to the Pine Talk, episode 007, where we tend to squawk, some call it an obsession. Your minds will awaken, information transferred, all for you shaken, not stirred. Hello and welcome to the seventh episode of Pine Talk. The podcast for the Pine64 community by members of the Pine64 community. I am Peter, website builder for linmob.net. And I am Ezra, open source gamer and breather of air. The community quote of the day today is by Shakespeare. An SSL error has occurred and a secure connection to the server cannot be made. <laughs> wow. He was truly ahead of his time. Would you agree? <laughs> um, this was by uh, Byrent Lape Lapay on uh, Twitter. Um, so thank you very much. It was entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, quite funny. I really had to laugh hard when I first read it, <laughs> and I really have to try to keep myself from bursting into a laughter here. <laughs> But we have got something to do today, and uh, we will discuss the April Pine64 community update, or parts of it, some more community news, as well as going through with some of your questions and feedback. But first, as a, what have we been up to lately? Well, me, recently, I have started playing an open source game that uh, you and probably everyone listening has never heard about it's called sulfur nimbus hell's elixir it's uh like i said completely open source it's made in by one guy it's made in java and it, the game is like a mixture of uh, a lot of nintendo 64 games like zelda or Kino time majora's mask uh mario 64 and sonic uh, you see, 64, i'm on topic unlike most other open source video games it has a narrative that puts meaning into your actions. I strongly suggest anyway, anyone who's interested to try it out and play it. Uh, otherwise, my personal journey in becoming an indie, ge indie game developer is uh, on track. I'm still working on my point-and-click adventure game that I keep mentioning. There's actually a page on Game Jolt if uh, you want to check it out. I think we can put a link somewhere. Um, it's releasing June 22nd. And I've also been learning uh, Godot, which is an open source game engine for my future projects. But uh, yeah, you can check all of that out on uh, my YouTube channel, my Itch page, my Game Jolt page. I always talk about it there so that I don't have to repeat to myself. I don't have to repeat myself to friends. I just send them links. <laughs> I'm very, very uh, good in conversation. That sounds... <laughs> Oh, it's really fun to talk to you then. <laughs> but we will put those links in the show notes to be sure. Awesome. Which you will find if they should not be like linked under the video mm -hmm. on pint64.org. What about you, Peter? What have you been up to? Yeah, uh, I may sound a little bit rusty. And that's because I've been spending a lot of time with Zola, mm -hmm. uh, named after the famous writer Emile Zola. A static site generator written in Rust. So I'm working on the relaunch of my blog, linmob.net, and I hope to have it done before the 1st of May. Mm -hmm. And after that, a ton of time is going into overhauling the tech of the app list I maintain at linmobapps.frama.io. I might even use Zola for this project too. I'm not quite sure about that but it's a thought that has crossed my mind also i played briefly with the pint cube and mm. uh, tweeted and tweeted about that and uh, we will just link that i still plan to use it as a webcam for my next live stream whenever that happens mm -hmm. so i can't really give any estimate on that i think it's but gonna be really cool sometime in the next few weeks, I would certainly hit the YouTubes again with a live stream, <laughs> pre-announced or not. And I'm going to use that Pine Cube as a camera. Awesome. But let's get to it now and deal with some feedback first. Mm -hmm. So we asked for feedback on, do you really want Linux phones? 
or our discussion of that. And we got some. So, first of all, Marta and Bram told me on Pine64's Discord server in the voice chat that his blog post is actually a rant. So, I was wrong. Apologies here. Uh, I told him to write his next rant in all caps <laughs> <laughs> to make it more clear. Yeah. And then, uh, just another Kiwi guy joined into that discussion on Mastodon. And he has a couple of great points um, on how to make a community welcoming and how to help new users getting uh, started. And I suggest you to read his post and the whole thread and maybe chime into this discussion because it sounds like he has a good idea here, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Of course, we also got plenty more feedback in the comments on YouTube, Odyssey and Tilbits. Thank you so much for all the kind words and your thoughts. It's very much appreciated. Otherwise, going into our community news. Um, yes. We've uh, seen the April community update. Uh, Pine64 uh, talked about the Linux App Summit designed to bring the global Linux community together to learn, collaborate, and help grow the Linux application ecosystem. Um, is that not exactly what I was talking about last episode? I think that is what you were saying. Um, anyway, in the past, Linux Application Summit has been a very nice event. And yes. I've watched a couple of its talks. I've never been there while it still happened in person, but... Uh, yeah. Well, that's that's really good to know. Uh, Pine64, among others, will be sponsoring this year's Linux App Summit, taking place May 13 to 15. Uh, and it will feature talks, panels, and Q&As on a wide range of topics covering everything from creating, packaging, and distributing apps to monetization within the Linux ecosystem, uh, designing beautiful applications and more all delivered by top experts in each field. That's me reading straight off their website, really. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm actually really uh, interested in seeing uh, monetization and what they're going to talk about that, how various projects make money while remaining open yeah. source and often in the same time actually monetarily free. So I suggest um, attending if uh, if you have some time to spare. I think I'll be attending myself. I imagine it being very insightful. What about you, Peter? Yeah, I've uh, already opened the re registration form, but I haven't gone through with it. That's mm -hmm. something I'm going to do after this show. Yeah, Because yeah, um, as someone who has an app list, uh, this is definitely an interesting summit. Yeah, for sure. Um, otherwise, uh, Pine64 announces or talks about various Pine phone accessories. Um, did you know, did you see the, they, so they have, uh, these cases with fingerprint, with a fingerprint reader and another one that's a wireless charger. And yeah. I think that's just so like amazing. It's so awesome to know that the Pine phone is modular enough to support custom back covers that add functionality to your phone. Um, I mean, they, they, they mentioned that the wireless charger isn't necessarily that, um, what they call like a, a dumb circuit that basically yeah. it's, it's just like a wrapped coil and just charges the battery. But still, you know, uh, I think it's really cool. And especially with the fingerprint reader, uh, people have been asking if, uh, they'll have a two for one. They say that they won't officially support it, but that it may be a possibility for anyone out there who wants to do that. Uh, but yeah, I think that's really cool. And I just love when seeing modular things like that. Like what, what do you want to create? Yeah. Maybe you can make a cool back cover that adds functionality to the phone. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Uh, put on a chainsaw or something. Yeah. <laughs> At a risk. <laughs> Not really. Please don't do that. <laughs> but the, I mean, yeah, the, the, the limb, the sky is limitless. Mm -hmm. And um, this, these are interesting back covers. I mean, we've saw we saw that keyboard cover before, 
Mm-hmm. Um, which also is still coming, even though, yeah, somehow things take longer than they usually do in 2021. Mm-hmm. But I'm positive it will eventually land. And these are exciting new additions. And especially the fingerprint reader. I mean, that was really totally a community effort. Yeah. So Zachary Schroeder, who started that, uh, just posted his original prototype on Reddit. And then uh, Point64 basically pounced on it. And now they are going to sell this as an official accessory soon. I think that's... Isn't that awesome? That is absolutely awesome. Absolutely amazing. And next thing you know, they're going to find a way to put a Risk Five chip on, on your back cover. <laughs> For, yeah, I don't know. Temperature? I don't know. <laughs> Using energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's... I mean, in theory, you could design a tiny solar panel or whatnot, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it likely would never produce enough energy to reasonably charge the pine phone, but you could do it. Extra power there's, is extra power. We need any pogo bit pins we need. Are there. Just do it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, just pogo those pins. <laughs> <laughs> Transitioning over from hardware to software, we've got a little link to lore.kernel.org where uh, initial patches to Linux mainline uh, that add support for the Rockship RK 3566 and 3568 SOCs have landed. So this means that the Quartz 64 support is uh, basically starting. And uh, that's great to see this uh, landing in mainline mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. soon before boards have even reached regular people that aren't developers. And that's going real well, I think. Yeah. So there's a lot more in the community update, and uh, we will get into that in a later episode of this podcast because we've got some more uh, for now. And, uh, yeah, we first want to try that open source firmware for the PinePhone modem before we talk about it. And we are very much looking forward to trying Infinitime on our own Pine Times. Uh, and then we will get into that some more. We promise. Hopefully we get it soon. Only time will tell. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's definitely right. <laughs> and so let's continue with community engagement and listener questions. So, our first community question is by Limon or Laimon, or I don't know, sorry for butchering your name, who has just ordered a pine phone and asks, what would be your top three recommendations of which OS to run on it and why? Mm-hmm. So, as a, what would you recommend someone to run on their pine phone? Well, my three would be in third place, Mobian. I mean, it's Debian on a phone. Literally the universal operating system. Uh, it's not perfect, but definitely, I mean, it's Debian on a phone. It's a mobile Debian. It's Mobian. It, it's, it, there's nothing more to say, really. It, it's stable, but uh, at the expense of older packages and it just, kind of runs you know so if you don't need to do much on your phone except call i think maybe mobian could be a good option especially within the future as all these os's update number two ubuntu touch uh, the ub ports team community did a, an absolutely great job in trying to make um their own like not replicate Android or not replicate iOS, but kind of having their own uh, way of of usage. I mean, obviously, you know, that also goes to Canonical's original design yeah. philosophy as well. But, but they did a good job uh, keeping it alive and, and building upon it. And it, it runs really well, for especially for the state that it's in. It runs very, very well. And there's just some bugs with it. I, I don't think... Um, like, I think texting might not work. I'm not exactly 
sure though right now i should have probably had that written down somewhere <laughs> there was a segment in the community update where they uh, go into what's uh, happening with kernel development and mm -hmm. the new kernel that's coming once it's landing yes is going to stabilize a few things here and there but i think text messages work but not on every carrier you know mm -hmm. that global game of carriers uh, that's always difficult well hopefully uh things get better with time but yes a solid second place ubuntu touch which only leaves my number one suggestion is manjaro and you can use any window manager or desktop environment i don't know what we're calling it but you know you can get fosh or lumiri or what i'm currently using because finally i installed it the uh uh Mo, uh, K, uh, what's it called? Plasma Mobile. I remembered. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running Plasma Mobile, and it's running really surprisingly smooth. Like there's a lot of things that run really, really well. But the main reason I adore Manjaro on Pine Phone is because its simplicity offers perfection for me. It offers a variety of nice UIs to choose from, which is a big part of Linux. The Linux community is choice, so I want to use Manjaro, but which UI do I want? Plus, its packages aren't too old as, say, Mobians, and it's not as restrictive as, say, Ubuntu Touch. I can do whatever I want, and Manjaro doesn't care, which is exactly what I want when I'm trying to like put my code and compile my engine on my phone. I just need, I just need a terminal, man. And I don't want to be restricted. And I need all my new libraries installed. So it does everything I need it for. Maybe, maybe that's not what you want out of a phone, but it's, it's, it's a perfect OS for me. I mean, what else is there to say? What about you, Peter? <laughs> what would, what would be your three OSs that you would run on oh, your phone? Oh, I'm going to start, uh, with the one I would, of course, run. And that is uh, Arch Linux Arm or Dankmix or Huang Tram Linux uh, with Fosh or whatever we call it by Danked12. Uh, if you want something rolling, something fresh, um, it's what I've been running for, I don't know, like since August, basically, mm -hmm. uh, most of the time. So it's great. And if something breaks, Danked is quick to fix it. So it's uh, ha it has been a good experience and i can only recommend it now of course uh, you only have first then and yeah that's why my number two is postmarket os and that is their new stable release 2103 um, with fosh or as xmo or plasma mobile you name it. Maybe even with XFCE. I have never tried that, hmm. but definitely should. Yeah, I want to uh, try Because PostMarket OS has a solid foundation and they may not have all the packages in the world, but that's what FlatHub was invented for, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, it's quite solid and really, when, when I briefly ran it uh, for, I don't know, a few two weeks maybe um recently as my main os uh it was really good in handling the modem so it's should be fine f for you uh, if you want to use it as the pine phone as phone with calling and you know that stuff mm -hmm. uh, which i personally don't do that often but um it's great at that and other things because well and if you want to, you can also easily uh, build your own packages. You just need to wrap your mind around uh, those APK build files. And then you can use PM Bootstrap on your computer, which you may have used to install this on your Pine phone anyway, uh, to compile those, cross-compile those, which will certainly help with build times for, I don't know, Rust apps or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So PostMarket OS is definitely on my my personal number two. And then third is Selfish OS, which is partly proprietary, but still always worth a try. Uh, especially since version 4 landed 
and yeah do try that maybe only on the sd card Mm -hmm. i would have if you hadn't i would have included OneDrive plus my mobile here too Mm -hmm. uh just to say that but um yeah so those are my three and our six so as there may be one more thing to take in mind if there's a distribution that you're most familiar with from running it on your linux desktop uh consider that mobile variant of this distribution if, mm-hmm. for example there's this unofficial fedora there's open suse and but not uh try that uh and see if it's stable enough for using um uh, we really sadly can't try every distribution all the time and figure out the bugs that you only f- see when you use it for weeks and weeks right there are mm-hmm. some of these hidden things that you don't notice when you just try it for a couple hours so do consider that too yeah, i think it's really good that you mentioned mentioned those last two uh, things it, it, it is interesting to consider um, what you're used to already in the yeah. world of Linux, or if this is your very lin- first Linux, you know, if, if this is the first time you're using Linux, you might want to consider getting uh, something that's more user-friendly, like maybe Ubuntu Touch or something like that. Yeah, but then again, I think Manjaro Plasma also is pretty good there because yeah. Discover tells you when there's updates, yeah. Uh, and then uh, if you are looking for software, maybe Linmob apps can help. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Because this Discover doesn't uh, discern between mobile-friendly and non-mobile-friendly software yet. Mm-hmm. Yay. I'd probably, Shameless have plug. <laughs> you know, I probably would have put Postmarket OS in fourth place if I could have put it, and I probably would have put it higher if I bothered to learn how it works. <laughs> Which yeah. I haven't done, and that's my main uh, problem with it. Is like I didn't even understand the package manager, and I simply couldn't be bothered. Which is not their fault, but no, you know that's just you. Yeah, <laughs> it's my laziness. I was like, ah, uh, you know, I I I know I know the Arch side of things. I know the uh, Debian side of things. Heck, I even know the f- Fedora and Red Hat side of things, but. Uh, I did not know enough of post-market's uh, side of Linux. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's special. Alpine is uh, quite unique in a way because mm. it's using Moosel instead of uh, the new C libraries and stuff. Uh, so, And then APK also has a different syntax. But uh, that's really... that. Those commands fit on one wiki page, and if you've read that or bookmarked it, then uh, you should be fine. Do I look so, like someone who reads wiki pages? Ah, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so moving on. <laughs> What's next? An email. Yeah, uh, and anonymous who prefers to remain private ask via email. Three questions. So uh, let's start with the first one. Mm-hmm. Is the Pine phone convergence bar meant to be used only when the phone is fully charged and without the bar plugged into power source? Or is it okay to plug the convergence bar into a power source when the phone is docked? So I know that I've used uh, the bar and the phone in both cases, and I see absolutely no difference. It, Though it's possible that when uh, plugged into power, that the phone may consume a bit more than uh, than it's being charged, so so you're slowly losing battery. It still doesn't. Um, I, I didn't see a difference, so you know, I wouldn't worry about breaking your phone if that's what you're worried about here. Use it in docked without charging it if you feel like it, or if you can charge it. I mean. You get some extra minutes, extra hours, if anything. Worst case yeah. scenario. What about you? Yeah, I I agree. Um, so I had issues with some of my chargers 
uh, when used with the convergence dog so that the convergence dog refused to put out a picture to my display when it was connected to certain power sources. Hmm. If that happens to you, just try another power adapter if you have some, because maybe you have a few of them, because USB-C is quite common by now, and mm -hmm. if you just have, you know, some more of those wall plugs, just and, and one cable, and try that, and repeat and until you find working solution. And then remember that and keep using that one. <laughs> um, but I don't think that you can actually break your phone by doing anything no. wrong here. In fact, I personally recently used PinePhone Convergence for doing that work with Zola on my website for fun because I figured, hey, like that I can uh, test the mobile version of the site right on the pine phone mm -hmm. uh, so yeah having a mobile viewport and a desktop viewport isn't that awesome on one device and i've used a different convergence stock that i bought uh w with a phone and it's um i don't know i talked about my laptop before i think the hp elite x3 laptop and this is the desktop dock that also came with that old phone. And that one is capable of charging the phone to the fullest while it's at full power, basically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe if you want to really use convergence for very long, consider getting another docking station. But, yeah, it's tough to figure out which ones work. And I really should put my knowledge in the Pine64 wiki. Uh, so that it's in there, because I haven't done that yet. Sorry for that. <laughs> okay, second question. What is the best way to back up the PinePhone beta? Yeah, I'm not sure I 100% understand this question. Uh, if what you're asking is how to return the phone to its uh, quote-unquote factory default... Uh, then it's uh, as simple as downloading and flashing the OS that originally came with the phone using a jump drive. Uh, in this case, it would be Manjaro Plasma Mobile. Uh, I think that's what's going to come uh, with the PinePhone Beta, right? Right. So, well, that's that answer. But if, if what you're asking is how to back up your personal data from the phone to perhaps put on a new OS, then it depends on... The distro, I think some OSs offer an easy to use solution to grab your data and put it on your desktop so that you can put it onto a different phone or something like that. But, um, I, I think the most streamlined solution as of now is probably just booting onto jump drive and exposing all the files directly or perhaps, uh, setting up, uh, an FTP or do like I do and install an SSH server on your phone and just use SCP to copy files from one device to another. <laughs> That's pretty good. You could also use rsync for that then. Mm. Uh, but like like you said, Ezra, I think jump drive is actually a good way to start. You can use jump drive um, in to, together with GNOME disks to make a full backup of your current install at any time. Um, so they can restore it later. So if you really want to try uh, another distribution on your EMC uh, and you're not sure on how to, uh, whether you like it, you can do that. So while I always recommend to try distributions on SD card, there may be reasons like you're really wanting to know how fast this can be uh, to do it on EMC and then jump drive and GNOME disks are uh, quite simple way to back up your entire pine phones emmc mm -hmm. also you can use other tools like based on duplicity or borg backup there are two gtk front ends that are well one is mo sort of mobile compliant and has a fully mobile compliant downstream fork by purism it's called dj dub and there's another one called pika backup which is a front end for Borg. That's also mobile compliant. Um, 
the problem with Pika Backup is that it's like not really packaged in many distributions. I think it might be on FlatHub, but uh, it's otherwise not really packaged. And it's a Rust app, so compiling it on the Pine phone is uh, yeah a tedious task. But that said, that's those are good tools to just back up your home folder and thus also saving SMS and uh, your, I don't know, your login into your Twitter client and all that and then restore it later and basically be logged in again. Okay, then he asked a third question, follow-up question. Is PinePhone convergence okay for email note-taking or too much lag? You see... Well, this also depends on the dish drill. Uh, if you use an email client instead of a web browser, you, uh, you increase your chances even further, like quite a lot. Um, I think that the Pine phone, uh, actually would be capable of doing that. Uh, but you'd have some potential obstacles when it comes to ease, ease of use over lag. I don't think lag. I don't even I don't think lag would be the issue if that was literally the two only things you do, note taking and emails. I think it could handle it. And even you were mentioning something about Laura that you were doing, Peter. Zola. Yeah, Zola, Zola yeah, right. Zola, that's what I meant. Yeah. All these O A names, right? Yeah. It's confusing. <laughs> Four letter names O and A. Well, I definitely have used evolution um to write emails and answer emails on the convergent pine phone and i've used note taking apps on it while browsing with a few tabs all at the same time uh that works um now convergence uh depends on the distro mm -hmm. so like and on the the graphical environment for example plasma mobile currently uh doesn't seem to focus on convergence much um Fosh is a tad better. Uh, SXMO would be, while well, hard to use, <laughs> sorry, but <laughs> arguably hard to use uh, on the phone would be perfect because it's just a tiling window manager. Mm -hmm. And if you know your way around tiling window managers, that would perfectly work. But then it hides the mouse cursor, so eh, not as difficult. So you would need to find a way to unhide the mouse cursor there. But Generally, uh, I've done all these things on like answering email in an email client um, on Fosh because uh, I was so distracted by all the pinned tabs with social media and matrix channels mm -hmm. that I uh, wouldn't would never answer my emails. And so I <laughs> took my Pine phone and did it on that thing. And that helped me answer like three emails in. 15 minutes or something hmm. so yeah it can uh, while it's a limited device that can actually help with you being focused because you have to say now because if you have that web browser open with uh, like 50 tabs like i sometimes do on my desktop the uh -huh. pine phone uh, uh, will not allow that <laughs> let's just put it like that so yeah um you can totally do note taking uh, or even writing, like I edited a bunch of old blog posts to fit the criteria that Zola has for front matter in Kate, <laughs> that KDE editor. I mainly use Kate because Kate uh, has uh, a terminal embedded with console, mm -hmm. and that makes it uh, quite handy because then the window management in convergent Fosh is not really uh, <laughs> where <laughs> your normal desktop is. For example, you've got no alt tab overview uh, and other things. So um, it's helpful if you've got those more integrated apps then. But yeah, I did that and it worked just fine. So uh, I can totally assure you that note taking and email should work just fine. Now let's get to our last segment here and that is the interview. So before we sat down to record this. I talked to Dank12, creator of Danknex slash Huangtram Linux, an ARM, Linux ARM-based distribution for the PinePhone and PineTap. So on this seventh episode of PineTalk, we have our second interview 
and I asked Dank12 to come on. So, hey, Dank12, introduce yourself. I'm a freelance developer. I, I love working on uh, Linux mobile, um, f- mostly the Pine phone and, uh, and uh, the Ubuntu Touch and uh, some Ubuntu Touch port. I'm, I'm currently maintaining the Ubuntu Touch port for uh, a Redmi Note 7 port for the uh, for uh, Ubuntu Touch and also the Redmi 4X as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I really love Ubuntu Touch. <laughs> it's really one of the best OS. Yeah. So, uh, how, because we asked this question last time, how did you get started with computing yourself so when did you first use a computer how did you get started with uh i don't know arch linux how did you get started with ubuntu touch um i first started using a computer when i was two uh two or three years old and it was one of those um um pentium three or pentium four computer um running windows 98 <laughs> <laughs> and I really don't know, uh, and I really don't know what what to do on the com- computer because uh, back in the day we 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 only have dial up internet and yeah yeah, <laughs> and so I was on the computer and I lo- <laughs> and uh, there was there was one of time when I discovered a directory uh, it, it's the Windows directory. <laughs> So I start <laughs> in there messing around with it, and I don't know, but but uh, there, but uh, sometimes I uh, accidentally delete. I don't know, but <laughs> but uh, the, the computer no longer works anymore, and uh, and um, yeah, my mom had and my mom had to call uh, up a technician just to uh, fix the computer. <laughs> And then I was banned from the computer. Okay. So yeah. That that was the really early beginnings. Yeah. I see. And um then how did you get started with Linux? Um back in twenty ten, um uh we 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 are using a computer that is uh is a I it's a fairly modern computer. It's the uh Intel Core i3 uh, 530 system with uh, only two gigs of RAM, and that one runs Windows Seven. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know what? I really love virtual. I really love virtualization because uh, because back with because back on my uh, Pentium Four computer running Windows XP. Yes, that 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 was an upgrade. Yeah. Um. I I I use Microsoft Virtual PC 2007 just to run, uh, just because I really like messing around with the uh, operating system and stuff. And so in uh, and so later we got to upgrade to uh, Windows 7 and a new computer. Yeah, that one had uh, VTX because it was a new computer because it because it is a fairly modern processor for the time. Yeah. And of course, I I I I use virtual PC. Continue to use the same old old uh thing. How I start with Linux is when I was when I was watching some random YouTube video. I saw, I saw um, I saw a thumbnail, uh, with computer with with a weird, like I don't know. It's it's not even Windows. It doesn't look like Windows at all. It doesn't look like a Mac. But it's something else. <laughs> so I look into it. It, uh, it was. Uh, I'm pretty. I'm. I'm pretty sure it was uh, Ubuntu ten, Ubuntu ten or something. Yeah. And so I down. And so because of that, I downloaded it, and I uh, installed it in uh, Virtual PC two thousand seven. But uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work. I don't. I have no idea why. But uh, I look it up, and uh, apparently, uh, it the, the software is not made to run li- that version of Linux. So. They told me to install uh, another virtual license software. Uh, that is a uh, virtual box. Yeah. Yeah. And then I install and then I install that and um 
yeah, I don't even know how to use Linux back back then. So I just uh, click on random things and uh, terminal and <laughs> and uh, the last thing I do is RMRF. And remember, <laughs> remember that I was I was only ten or eleven at that time. So yeah, I mean at that age you don't often really know what you're doing with the computer anyway. Until 2016, 2016 when I got a new computer. Uh, it's the same computer I'm currently using to develop uh, Arch Linux on it. And uh, yeah, it's a Core i7-6700K with 8 gigs of RAM. I installed Ubuntu on it, yeah. Ubuntu 1604, and uh, that's when I started learning to use Linux. Yeah, and uh, it was a long trip for me, and I'm still uh, learning today. Uh, yeah, and that's it. That's great. And then I switched to Arch Linux, uh, and before Arch Linux, uh, uh, there was Antigos. Yeah, and then uh, I've used that too. Uh, I and then I switched to uh, Arch Linux a year later, sometime, and that's it. I'm still using the same installation today. That's great. So how often did you have to uh, consult the ArchWiki to fix some bugs that <laughs> happened during upgrades? Um, I would say some of them I had to Google it just to yeah. just just to see what just see if other has the same issue and and uh, how did they fix it? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, most same. of the but most of the issue on Linux, I just Google and the issues yeah. that I don't know how to resolve, I just Google it, and I found the answer. Yeah, then then you're fine. Yeah, mm. yeah same here. Uh, <laughs> great, good. So, uh, when did you first hear of Pine sixty four? Was it before the Pine phone or uh, with the Pine phone? Um, back then, I I was a post market OS core developer for a short period of time before I get uh, a little bit busy. Um, uh, Matai Bram uh, told the people in, uh, in yeah. the core team that, uh, "Hey, Pine sixty four had this tablet. Uh, does anyone want want to develop on this? This or something? It was a GitLab page, uh, a GitLab issue page." And so I said, yeah, sure. And then I, and then I, uh, and then the, f- and then I got a tracking number from Ascendia a few days later. <laughs> and then, uh, and then I was too excited because I don't even know, know what that is, what is, uh, what's how the tablet looks like. And so I patiently wait. It took like a few weeks or something. And eventually I got it. And yeah, that's, that, that's when I first heard about Pine sixty four. Is the Pine uh is from the Pine Tab prototype. Fun fact about the Pine Tab, that particular unit is that, that the bash that they run, mm. they they accidentally uh put the wrong ch- RAM chip on it. So instead of the instead of two gigabytes, you only get one gigabyte. <laughs> okay. So you have to do some more memory optimization to use that thing. Yeah, yeah, it runs uh, run out memory really, really fast. Yeah. Especially when you uh, when you try to uh, do something. Cool <laughs> Open on Firefox. It. Oh, <laughs> snap! I I I make a video of uh, Chromium running on uh, the Pine Tab. It runs um it run decently. But uh, not, but not really fast at all. Yeah, not for long, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and that was just only one tap or something. So, Great. so that's fine. Okay, and then eventually you uh, transitioned over to the Pine Phone, right? Yeah, a few months later, um, I, I got another tracking number, <laughs> and and this one is a uh, Pine Phone development device. And uh, this oh. was way before the Braveheart. And yeah. this was after the Don't Be Evil. And the yeah. development phone... So was it a kit that you had to put together on your own? No, no, no. Or it was, was it fr- already assembled? It was already uh, assembled. Already assembled. And uh, it looks exactly like 
the pine phone that everyone is currently holding on their hands. It looks exactly like that, it's just the motherboard is different. And uh, unfortunately on that unit, uh, there, was a per there was a problem with the modem. Um, when I first got it, it, it was working fine, but then uh, when I charged the battery, uh, when I fully charged the battery, uh, I unplugged it and then the phone just died. I have oh, no. no idea why. I have no idea what is going on. I plug it in and then it said uh, 72% or something. Uh, it's like battery is still full. It still has juice on it. But when I unplug it, it dies again. I spent uh, a few days trying to figure out what the hell is going on. But uh, but uh, eventually, looking at the... Uh, uh, why I was playing around with the uh, kill switches, I killed the modem. And then I tried oh. to boot it up again. And boom, it works again, except the modem. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so breakage happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At that point, it's like a Pinecom prototype. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Pinecom with a modem. Yeah. Um, so when did you start uh, Huang Tram Linux or Zangnix <laughs> or whatever you call it? You know, your, your Arch Linux ARM version. <clears throat> when did you start that? And why? Um, I start Arch Linux. Uh, I start porting Arch Linux to uh, the Pine tab way back in uh, way back in uh, late 2019. I I I first built an image for the Pine tab, um, and uh, that one is um, is. I gave it LSQT. You can still download yeah. that image anyway, but um, but unfortunately, on the new Pine tab, they changed the LCD, so now it no longer. I mean, it still works, but you don't get to see anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I work on it way before uh, the Pine tab even arrives on people's hand. So, okay, uh, so you were quite early there. Yeah, and then I just. Uh, and then I just uh, abandoned it because I had uh, works to do on post market OS. Yeah. And and yeah. And uh, I also make a, a bare bone image up for the uh, Pine Phone as well. Unfortunately, uh, I didn't properly configure it, so so there's no sound. Okay. Yeah, people had to live with that for months. <laughs> well, months. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, Arch Linux back then, my own Arch port back then, it's not like the one that everyone is currently using right now. Yeah, it's just like a bare bone image. Yeah, it's like it's just only shell and USB. That's it. Okay, so bare bone image uh, kernel working for the device, and that's it. Yeah, and I still keep that legacy. Yeah. And people have been building on that, right? Uh, uh, with the SXMO spin, with that script. So even if people aren't really that uh, skillful that they can really build something themselves, they can now use that script to get something out of it. Yeah. Yeah, I have seen a lot of cool stuff built from the barebone image. And I and uh X, uh SX MO is uh one of the cool projects out there that uh, people should try out definitely uh, yeah uh, I'm, I'm f <laughs> i i should feel ashamed for saying this but i have never tried out SX MO on my <laughs> iphone <laughs> yeah uh, i i tried it and uh, i i have to tell you it it wasn't easy at first i mean eventually I felt comfortable enough with it so that I made my first video and that was still really bad. And you re you really need time to get used to uh, how you have to control that. So, yeah, I I I agree. So, is it just you that works on uh your distribution or your your part of, part of Arch Linux arm to the Pine phone or are there more people working on this? Um mostly it's just me 
it's just one person trying to uh <laughs> trying to uh, uh to track all the changes <laughs> yeah trying to keep and i have to make sure that the distribution doesn't break as well yeah. i know that uh, i know that uh sometimes it does break but <laughs> but i really but i really don't want it to break so i i i try my best to uh, tell people uh get me locked and yeah. uh, hopefully and um, Hopefully, I can uh, help them fixing it, or maybe someone in the chat could help them fix it. Yeah, um, but you're—I think you're doing a really good job with that because uh, I've been having uh, in, installs around for a month, and they didn't really ever fully break. And if there was a little breakage, then you fix it quite quickly, always. So, uh, really, uh, congratulations to doing such a good job. Um, so. Is there areas uh, where where help is needed b besides helping people out in the chat? Um, I am currently working on a Flasma mobile images for the uh, arch thing. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I would. Uh, I'm I'm going to try and make, try to maintain two and uh, UIs. Oh, that's a lot of work. Yep, it's it's a lot of work, but thankfully that uh, most of the chains are also in uh, mainline uh, Plasma, which is cool. Yeah. Thanks, KDE team, for uh, having me to do less work. Yeah, if this so was a year ago, then then I would be <laughs> dead right now. Yeah, oh, tons, of, a... tons of downstream patches and stuff. <laughs> Great, so... Yeah, I was going to ask you about future plans, but uh, you just talked about Plasma, so I think uh, that's maybe all there is, right? Or do you have other future plans? Um, in the future, I I plan to uh, I plan to bring uh, Arch Linux to uh, other devices, uh, such as uh, my Redmi Note Seven. <laughs> okay. My Redmi Note Seven, and uh, and try to maintain uh, Avex Tech Pro One for yeah. the uh, uh, Arch uh, Arch as well, and yeah. also and also I have a Vodafone unit as well. So oh, yeah. So, so I would, I so I would want to try to uh, port or bring Arch onto that device as well. Oh, that mm. sounds sounds promising. Great. Yeah. Um, so, aside from that, I've been reading your blog lately, and uh, you just wrote something about the Pinebook Pro. Mm -hmm. So, how is your experience with that device? I would say, for me, uh, it does fine for me. It does fine for me. Um, I, 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 will, I usually use that laptop just to SSH to my home desktop and start working on Arch. <laughs> stuff. Um, and uh, of course, I don't bring my phone, so I just you way VNC, which I which I make a blog post about on yeah, how to that. use it, and um, yeah. So I just uh, SSH tunnel, uh, start the way VNC server, SSH tunnel, and uh, and that's it. You're now using uh, Arch without a phone. Great. Uh, the for the um, performance on the Pinebook Pro is um, so far, I would say, is particularly not that fast. I mean, I mean, it's yeah. it's. I mean, the performance should be some somewhere like a netbook, like a. Yeah, but it's better than those old netbooks, isn't it? I mean, it has more RAM, so that would certainly help. But yeah, it's. It's not a supercomputer. So if you think six core notebook and you think six core Intel notebook, no, not as fast, right? Yeah, yeah. If if you're looking for that kind of computer, then it's better to just to buy an re just to buy an actual laptop. That would be a much much better option. I mean, as in um, actual x86 laptop on the market. Yeah. Or you can just buy old laptops instead. They, um, 
they intend they tend to have better performance than the Pine Buffalo. Aside that, the Pine Buffalo is a really cool device for uh for thinkers and uh, people uh, that wants a uh, arm laptop for app development. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it has its its niche. Yep. Or its niche, right? Yeah. Great. And uh, also, and also try out uh, all the Linux uh, distribution on the on the uh, Pine Buffalo as well. Um, and uh, currently, the only distribution that I have tried so far is Ambient, because uh, I was on the go at that time, and I start downloading. Uh, Arbion GNOME on my mobile data, okay. and then uh, and then an hour later, I got an um, I got a message from from the uh, carrier telling me that uh, I have run out of fast data, so I uh, high oh. speed data, so so I have to leap with the uh, speed from thirty years ago. <laughs> ah, oh, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> That's bad, but it's my fault. <laughs> yeah, still, still, I feel sorry for you. Great. So, again, thank you for this interview and talk to you soon. See ya. Do you have a comment on the interview, Ezra? Yeah, he he sounds fun, hardworking too. Uh, I'm really glad to have someone like him in our community. It's uh, It's somewhat inspiring, you know, like I ask myself, how will I contribute to the community? It's just nice to see how he, um, you know, his his story, uh, what 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 he, uh, how he started and where he first contributed and yeah. where he is now. So yeah, I'd love to contribute <laughs> to the community. And then I remember that uh, I'm co-hosting this podcast, doing one eighth of the work, but raking in 100% of the benefits. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, I hope someday to contribute to a code base of some open source project in a meaningful way at some point as well. Great. So I can uh, say uh, only say again, thank you, Denkt12, for taking the time. And we hope to have more interviews going forward. If you are subscribed to our MP3 feed, Check out the chapter markers. These can be handy if you vaguely remember something we have talked about and want to find it again. Or if you find a segment really boring and want to skip ahead. If you don't need these chapter markers, save thumb bandwidth and use my beloved Opus version. Once more, a huge thanks to Nerdzoom Media for being our awesome audio producers. And that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back in two weeks. Remember, this is a community podcast, so please leave feedback on what we should do better. Get your suggestions in, and feel free to ask questions. Really, ask questions. Please, please. ask questions. You can join the Discord channel, pinetalk-podcast, on Pine64's Discord. You can send us an email. Please send us an email at pine talk at pine64.org and tweet at us we're at pine or no sorry we're at talk pine <laughs> i remember we've joined mastodon and we're at talk pine at uh, if you can't remember these names just use the hashtag ask pine talk so thanks again and goodbye Bye bye <laughs>